بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى لبيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين ذهب الله عنهم رجسا وطهرهم تطهيرا قال الله الحكيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كتبنا في الزبور من بعد الذكر أن العرض يريثها عبادي الصالحون صدق الله العلي العظيم A series of discussions have gone into a second night. In these unprecedented circumstances, something that we've never seen before in history, communities are calling this virus unprecedented. No, viruses have come and they've gone. The global reach of this virus is phenomenal. The entire world has come to a standstill. To think that there was one Namrud and a small mosquito born Namrud down. In the very same way, today you're seeing that this humanity that's full of arrogance has been brought down by something that can't even be seen. Know that there's a sunnah here. Sunnah of Allah is this. That when he wants to bring down somebody arrogant, he brings them down with something very small. He teaches them when he tells them, when he shows the world, it becomes an ibrah, becomes a lesson for the world. That if you are to stand up in the position of Allah, then Allah will humiliate you. And this is why you see that a man like Sayyid al-Shuhada, who Yazid thought was weak. But today, all across the world, from one end to the other end, today nobody remembers Yazid, but everyone remembers Hussein. 1400 years ago, there was a man. He was standing there with his family. Had he wanted to go for a war, he would have gone to a mountain, he would have brought an army with him. One tradition says that a person comes, he says that there are 10,000 archers from Yemen, I can bring you to help you. Sayyid al-Shuhada says, look, we're not going to fight. Sayyid al-Shuhada goes with his family. And here Yazid was thinking that Hussein is finished. Little did he know that Allah was going to create a nation who was going to cry over Hussein. The power of these tears, that's what's unprecedented. Do you know how powerful your tears are? Your tears are so powerful that it shakes the arsh of Allah. This entire journey of Karbala is a journey of tears, a journey of realization. So look, today people are in their houses. Today, you're doing majlis from your homes. Today you can't be one body physically, as the hadith says, that become one body and mourn for Hussein. But look, there's a deeper philosophy if you look into it. Why after 1400 years has Allah made it like this? Only one thing comes to mind. If you've ever been to the zarih of Sayyid al-Shuhada, on the night of Qadr, that every single year with the blessings of Allah were there, you'll see that the last half an hour before Fajr, the entire room is full, Zarih room, and everyone standing there saying, Allahumma ajjil waliyak al faraj. Any dua which is done under the dome of Imam Hussein becomes mustajab. 
You're praying for the coming of that Savior. So what does Allah do? He gives you an opportunity to accelerate the coming of that Savior. Why? As we mentioned yesterday, if every single family connects on these nights, you can see that domino effect to accelerate the coming of the Savior. It can happen. How do you do it though? Remember, wilaya is important. The most important thing that we have is the wilaya. If wilaya is there, what is wilaya? Look, there's two components to it. Wilaya is that love. Wilaya is the governance of Ahlul Bayt over you. Two dimensions. But if you go deeper, what do you find? Wilaya is linked to the wilaya of Allah. Innama waliyakum Allah wa rasulahu. The extension of the wilaya of the Prophet is the wilaya of the Ayyam salam. And when that wilaya from the heart begins to flow, then what happens? History begins to change. The reason why we're not prepared for the 12th Imam is because we're not able to enhance that wilaya, to channel that wilaya. But the minute you are, the whole journey is a journey of the heart. You can read as many books as you want. It won't take you to that maqam. What takes you to that maqam is your tears. Why? It humbles you, it destroys you, and it cleans your heart. Had it been for the fact that books could take you there, every academic today would have been able to go to that maqam. It's not the case. It's the movement of the heart. Why? Because the heart is the haram of Allah. Hadith says nothing can hold Allah but the heart of the believing servant. Your heart is that powerful. Understand it. But the heart gets tarnished. So Allah gives us this opportunity today. Look, do you think I like looking into a camera? If only we were all together. But the fact is we're not. But there's a secret behind that. Imagine that secret. Imagine when 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock comes or 9 o'clock comes. You're sitting there. On the floor. You've laid your cloth. Your screen is in front of you. 7 o'clock comes, 8 o'clock. Close your phones. Switch them off. Bring your family. Focus. Why? You know why it's important? I'll tell you why. For one reason only. The minute that you make the niyyah of Hussein's majlis, you will find the Zahra will come to all of our houses. And when Zahra comes, remember one thing. She's coming to your house. If you're on the phone, you've disrespected her. If you're talking, you've disrespected her. And when you disrespect her, you disrespect all of the Aimma. Adab. There's no halal and haram in this. You can sit on your phone if you want to, but remember one thing. Be very vigilant. Adab is what takes you to the higher maqams. Remember Habib ibn Mabahir. Remember the likes of Maytham at Dammar. Remember the likes of Salman. How does Salman get to the 10th level of Iman? When he rubs his beard on the door of Zahra. When he rubs his forehead on that door. If ever you get to go to Medina and you come to that Hujra of Zahra, rub your head there. Why? Because just rubbing it will give you Ma'rifah. You don't understand. Look, Quran says there was a prophet who went blind. Who was that prophet? Ya'qub. When he rubbed a shirt of Yusuf, it was enough to bring a sight back. So what do you think? If, it's, if a shirt is good enough for a prophet, this is Hussein ibn Ali's mother. There's a hadith on this. Allama Mustambit narrates this. He says, one day, Amir al-Mu'mineen was sitting there. Rasulullah was with him. Four-year-old boy comes running in. Who's that four-year-old boy? Sayyid al-Shuhada. As he comes forward, he asks a question. He says, grandfather. Grandfather goes, hugs him. It was the way Rasulullah did. He would kiss Imam Hussein on the forehead. He would hug him, hold him close. So at that moment, Amir al-Mu'mineen says, he says, Ya Rasulullah, you love my Hussein a lot, don't you? He says, how can I not? Hussein is from me. How can I not? So at that moment, he continues and he says, who do you love more? Me or Hussein? Hadith. Strange question to ask. Actually, no. There's a lesson behind that. Amir al-Mu'mineen is smiling. 
And when he smiles, it's not for you. It's not for him, it's for you. So at that moment, Rasulullah looks up and he says, Ali, why don't you tell your son Hussein your fawail? Hadith is a long one. Amir al-Mu'mineen mentions 50 different fawail of who Amir al-Mu'mineen is. From being Babullah, to Nurullah, to Yadullah, to Aynullah, to Lisanullah. And he continues 50 different qualities. But then he comes to Hussein. He says, Hussein, then why don't you tell your father what your qualities are? So he looks up and he says, my grandfather loves a person who has two qualities in them. One is the fadila. Two is nasab. He says, my father is greater than me. I have no doubt about that. But let me tell you my nasab. He looks towards his father. He says, father, if you don't mind, my nasab is greater than your nasab. You know why? Because my father is Ali ibn Abi Talib and my mother is Fatima to Zahra and my grandfather is Rasulullah and my uncle is Jafar. Imagine who these personalities are. As Amir al Amir al Mu'minin's son saying, My father is you. Who are you? You are that person who, when any of the Anbiya had a problem, you'd be there to save them. Look at the Bible and see who's Aaliyah. There's only one man who claims to be Aaliyah. Whenever you have a problem, call upon Amir al Mu'minin. See what happens. Look, I don't have the time at the moment to go into it. Maybe in the later nights we'll look at it. The biggest formula for a Shia, the biggest weapon is Nade Ali. So let me tell you something then. Ayatollah Kashmiri, Abdul Karim Kashmiri, Sahib Karamat. His students are Sahib Karamat. So imagine what Ayatollah Abdul Karim Kashmiri is. Ayatollah Abdul Karim Kashmiri, for one istikhara, is to take a bead. From the bead, he would tell you the verse of the Quran and tell you 56 different sides of that outcome of what you thought about. And basically, until the day you die, I could tell you. Until Ayatollah Bahjid came to him and says, please don't tell people all of these things. That Ayatollah Abdul Karim Kashmiri says, my teacher said that if ever we have a problem, we recite or we make the niya that we will recite Nadir Ali for 40 days, 110 times. Or Afar say, in this world, Ali is Haider Karrar. In that world, he is Ghalib ala kulli Ghalib. If you understand the Mural Mu'min and use the name of the Imam. No, more than that, what does he say? He says, my Jad is Rasulullah. If ever you want to extend your Ma'rifah, remember, it's your sins that stop your Ma'rifah. It's your sins that stop the Wilaya from you connecting. It's because of we, the fact that we sin, we're pushed back. So what is Rasulullah? Quran says, if you ever sin, take the wasil of Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, ask Allah to forgive us. What happens? Heart becomes pure. Nadir Ali comes into play. You see yourself flying. He doesn't stop there. Though. Who does he say afterwards? He says, but my mother is Fatima. I don't need to say anything. If you understand who she is, just one Ya Zahra is enough. You know how much a child loves his mother? Now imagine how much Hussein loves his mother. And I wish we had an opportunity to go deeper. And maybe we will do in the coming nights. But let me take it a step further. And that step further is this. Then he says, my uncle is Ja'far at Tayyar. Who is Ja'far? He has two wings in the heavens. But let me tell you something. Whenever anyone had a problem in Qum, they would go to Ayatollah Bahjad. And one of them is in front of me. It's a man who couldn't get married. In fact, he's from one of the famous English speakers in the world today. So I don't want to mention his name. Because he still is on the member. He goes to a friend of mine. He says, can you ask Ayatollah Bahjad? I'm not getting married. My mother is concerned. Could you go and ask Ayatollah Bahjad if there's something I can recite? Ayatollah Bahjad said one thing, and he would say this as a cure for everything. He says, go and recite Ja'far. What is Ja'far? Ja'far Tayyar. 
right? He says, but you don't recite it. If his mother is alive, ask his mother to recite it. Now, in the Mufatihul Jinan, the dua, according to Ayatollah Bahjad, that comes after that you're meant to recite, he says, that's not the actual dua. He goes, go to Zad al Ma'ad, the actual dua is there. And when you go into sajda, a couple of drops of tears, let it come into your mother's eyes. No time had passed. Alhamdulillah, he was married. So when our youth from across the world, from Maryland, message to say that we're not getting married, ask your mothers to go and recite Ja'far. Salah Ja'far. Zad al-Ma'ad, go get the dua, go into sajda, two drops of tears, that's all. Why? Everything comes back to tears. What is about those tears? Now imagine if those tears come into your eyes in sajda and a mother says, Allah, for the sake of these tears that I shed for Hussein. You hear a lot about big scholars. Have you ever heard about their mothers? You know when Imam Hussein is brought to the courts of Marwan at the time? You know what Imam Hussein says? He says, how can a person like me give bayya to Yazid? Then you hear the famous saying where he says, hey, heart, min There's something he says after that. He says, my mother hasn't given me that kind of tarbiyah that I give bayya to Yazid. He remembered his mother then, hujjat of Allah. If I put it to you in another way, if a person's close to their mother, even after their mother dies, if they're ever faced with a problem, what do they say? My mother was alive, she would have said no to this. Out of respect for the mother, you take a step back. So imagine if your mother's Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. But let me take it a step further. Let me give you a story, just to emphasize this. Ayatollah Ansari, Sheikh Ansari, is the greatest marja that we've had after which there's been no marja like that. 150 years ago. Khatam al fuqaha nobody else like that afterwards. One day his mother comes from Iran and she comes to Najaf. And all the women of Najaf came, they were kissing her on the hand, they were kissing her on the forehead. So she says to her son, she says, son, why are all these women coming to kiss my forehead and my hand for? He says, mother, because you've come for the ziyarah of Allah. So she says, actually, Loads of people come for the ziyarah of Imam Hussein. Why is, why are they coming to kiss my hand, my forehead? She says, because mother, you're ahl tahajjud. She says, but there's many people ahl tahajjud. She says, no, but mother, you read your salam time. Many people read. Eventually, she says, son, why? He says, okay, let me tell you. It's because I'm the marja. That's why. You know what she looked up and she said? She says, son, remember one thing. Above and beyond all of that, remember to stay humble. A mother is that person who, even if you're the marja of the Shia, she still continues to give you tarbiyah. That is a mother. This is why they say, respect your mothers. That today, if you're in the majlis of Hussein, it's because of your mother. Continuously gives tarbiyah. And if your mother's not alive, just remember one thing. You can be disowned. Still be dis Mother and father can still disown you after their death. Why is that? Because that mother and father will say, Son, daughter, now that we're not alive, you've forgotten us. Make it a president. Well, every week if you can, every month, go to their graves. And if you can't, recite a fatiha. Do a majlis. Do something. This is what Ahlul Bayt teaches us. Adab is what's important. But let me tell you something. You know when you go to the ziyarah, of Zahra alayhi salam, open up the book and see. You know what it says in there? It says, Salam on you, Um Mu'mineen. Ummul Mu'mineen. You think only a person whose blood related to Zahra can call her mother? All of those people who truly know how to shed tears for Imam Hussein can call her mother. Now imagine when you fall into problems and you say, Mother, come and help me. 
If an average mother can't take when her son falls onto the ground, how can that mother take it when one of her Shias are in trouble? She comes very fast to your help. She comes to you. She helps you. This is why, in fact, this COVID-19 era could be a blessing in disguise. When you're sitting at home and your heart is broken, and at that moment you say, Zahra, what better mother than you to come and help us? Think Zahra salam, doesn't come to your help? See, these are some of the things. Reconnect your heart with Wilaya. Let me go on a story for you. Let's go on a journey. There's something that I want to complete. Look, you see, Allah is absolute. There's no second to Allah. So for Allah to create even requires there to be a huge shift. Because when the absolute is absolute, then there's no second. Now, without going too deeply into the philosophy, there's something which is known as ta'ayyun, delimitation. When Allah delimits himself and manifests himself, that's when you find that creation is created. The first thing Allah created, Haqiqat Muhammadiyah, right? After that, what happens? The spiritual realm is created, which becomes another hijab. The physical realm is created, which becomes another hijab. Your sins and your lack of knowledge, and all of a sudden, there's so many hijabs between you and the wilay of Allah. What is the best and fastest way of... This is why. What's important? Wipe out your sins, develop your ma'rifah, and you see you go straight. What's the best way though? Wilai is the way to connect back. Spiritual realm is a hijab. Physical world is a hijab. Your sins are a hijab. Your lack of knowledge is a hijab. What is the fastest way? Wilaya. How do we connect onto that wilaya? Azav Hussein. There's something I said yesterday. I didn't elaborate on it. I'm going to elaborate on it today. Remember I said yesterday, Laylatul Qadr is actually secondary for you. Actually, it's for the Imam. Better than a thousand months, better than a lifetime. But how does one connect to Laylatul Qadr, which is important? You connect, you gain ma'rif of, and remember, to gain ma'rif of Laylatul Qadr is to gain ma'rif of Zahra, alayhi salam. How do you do that though? What's the purpose of that? Look, Allah's da'imul faith, continuously He's giving faith. Why is it that it doesn't reach you? Because of your sins. When does it reach you? When Hujjatullah is praying and you connect onto that prayer. Tahajjud, for example, last one third of the night. Dua is accepted the fastest then. Why? Your Imam is praying. When you come to the Majlis of Imam Hussein, when the Masaib, the Musibas, when Imam is crying. What happens then? Laylatul Qadr. It's not just about staying awake. It's about that moment when the heart connects to the hujjah and then everything is accepted. Ma'arifah increases. So what is this? Majlis is that thing that brings together all of the amma in any of this one hour, 45 minutes, whatever it may be. At any stage, if the heart connects as the lutf of the imam, your ma'arifah increases. When your ma'arifah increases, you become a different person when you go outside. But look, let me elaborate more. And perhaps it's a bit of philosophy here. But hopefully if we can get this introductory two or three days, we can go on to our topic. So let's move on this very quickly. Look, understand Wilai in this way. Wilai is an umbrella that encompasses Risalat and Nabuwa. The first person on earth is Adam. But Adam is Sahib Wilaya. He's Waliullah. Remember one thing. All of Wilaya goes back to Amir al muminin we have 124,000 prophets according to a tradition. The tradition is weak. We can also have another hadith says 320,000. Regardless of which hadith is correct, the fact is we've got a lot of anbiya. Do you know all of their names? No. Why don't you know all of their names? Because a Nabi is not allowed to declare that he's a Nabi until Allah doesn't give him the hukum. How many Nabis declared? 313. Who were they? Rasul. Rasul is that person who takes a message to the people, so you know who they are. From all of those Rasuls, five of them are special. Now look, we don't have time to go into the details. You go to usul kafi there's four sections of what a Nabi is. One Nabi is this, two Nabi is this, and the final stage of a Nabi is an Imam. 
five prophets have got to that stage who were imams. They developed to that stage, right? They developed to that stage. Each one of them developed to that stage. There's only one who had it from the beginning, and that is Rasulullah. Rasulullah had it. In the same way, if you look in this world, there are two types of people who are going towards Allah, two types of mystics. One is Salik il Allah. You've heard of the term, right? He goes stage by stage by stage, and then he reaches Allah. The other type of an Arif is known as Majzub, a person who goes from zero to a hundred in one go. When you go step by step by step, look, when you go into the field of Irfan, your teacher monitors you to make sure that no bala comes on you. Because as you grow closer to Allah, the trial and tribulation increases. This is why they say, go to somebody who's Kamil. For example, if you went to Ayatollah Bahchid, he would remove the hurdles, spiritual hurdles. Why? Because the biggest problem is this, depression. When you go on this pathway, every name of Allah has an effect on you, positive and negative. The spiritual master removes the negativity and step by step by step you go. That's a salik. In this way, you notice Musa step by step by step until he gets to the final level. Ibrahim, Nabi, right? Step by step. Khalil, Rasul, Imam, step by step by step. In the same way, Isa, your prophet goes from the very beginning to the highest maqam. Why? Majzub. Quran also says this. فَلَمَّ جَاءَ مُوسَى لِمِقَاتِ Right? Musa has to go at the invitation of Allah. When you look at Rasulullah, what does it say? Subhan alladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al masjid al haram ila al masjid al aqsa. One goes towards Allah, the other Allah pulls towards him. There's a difference there. Why? Majzub. Who? From all the Urafa, they say Ayatullah Bahchid was Majzub at the age of 14, Sahib at al ard. In a blink of an eye at 14, he was going from one end of the earth to the other. But other people st said, Ali Qadi Marhum, step by step by step. And to, if you were to ask somebody, what would you want to be? Majzub, of course. Responsibility is more though. So now to come back. Every prophet is tested. Every Ahle Wilaya is tested. Wilaya is Insani Kamils. Who is that? Amir al muminin One Noor is created. That nur is the nur of the Prophet that contains the wilaya. Ana wa Ali min nur and wahid. That nur has two components: Amir al Mu'minin and Rasulullah. Outer is Rasalat, Batin is wilaya. Imamat itself, Batin is wilaya. Greater than Rasalat and Nabuwa is wilaya. All of these are grades of wilaya. Why? Rasul is a Rasul in this world. Nabi is a Nabi in this world. And each one of them are Walis. So it comes under the bracket of Wilaya. Remember this. Allah's name is not Nabi or Rasul. Allah's name is Wali. And Allah's Wali for both levels of creation. And therefore, Allah's name Wali transcends everything. And when Allah gives Wilaya to somebody, the first stage of Wilaya is the Haqiqat al Muhammadiyah. This is why the Quran says, Innama waliyakum Allah wa Rasuluhu. And that person who in Ruku gives Zakat, all three of these are Wali, all three of them have Wilaya. What happens in Ghadir al Qum? You go to Ghadir al Qum, and what you find Rasulullah saying, Allah says to Rasulullah, Ya ayyuha Rasul Balligh. Do tabligh of what? This message, if you don't, fama balakhta risalata. Your risala is not accepted. What does it mean, your risala? 124,000 prophets from Adam to Khatam, everything is gone. Everything is gone. Adam began a message. When we say Rasulullah is khatam in Nabiyin, like this is a khatam. This is a stamp. Let's say it's got writing on it. In America, you won't find this very much because you're a modern society, only two, three hundred years old. Those places where there's kingship, for example, like we are here in the United Kingdom, when the queen seals something, she does khatm, stamps it. That means that it's sealed. Rasulullah 
is that seal that stamps it. It means it's legitimate now. I can write a whole document without the seal it doesn't become legitimate. In this country, when the queen puts her stamp to it, it means it's legitimate. Every law from parliament has to go to the queen. If she stamps it, it becomes legitimate. Rasulullah is that stamp that initiates to say that the Rasalat of all of the prophets is legitimate. But in Ghadir, it tells us something that the ink Rasulullah uses to stamp is known as Ali ibn Abi Talib. Why? Ya ayyuhar Rasul Balik. Tell them. Tell them. What? Man kunta mawlahu fahada Ali and mawla. Mawla wali. Wali. And before that, okay, you can turn around and say there's 23, 24, 27 meanings. An-Nabi, Awla bil... An-Nabi Awla bil mu'mineen min anfusahim. Rasulullah is Awla. Then all of the believers are to themselves. In the same way, Amir al-Mu'mineen is Awla to you then you are to yourself. What does that mean? If Ali says jump, you jump. If Ali says sit, you sit. Why? You've heard this before. I'm not saying anything new. Every khatib, every zakir, every alim will come and tell you that Nabi has more rights over you. Ali has more rights over you. But let me tell you why. Three reasons. First reason is this. Because their ilm is kamil. Absolute knowledge. Secondly, they're ma'asum. And thirdly, they love you more than you love yourself. This is why submission to the will of the Imam is important. Salman submits. Habib submits. Maytham submits. Imagine that Abbas, who from the very beginning of his life was told that your purpose is to protect Hussein. Sayyidu Shuhada sends him to get water. Didn't Abbas have a right to turn around and say, if it was a normal person, what would they have said? Mola, I've been created to fight. But Abbas knows Hussein loves me more than I love myself. If Imam Hus ilm kamil, ma'asum, character is perfect, loves me more than myself, submission to the Imam becomes wajib. Why is it today that we're so far behind? Why is it today that we aren't proper Shia, our Imams are not coming? Because we haven't understood the true meaning of submission. If we can understand this, only then does the will I enhance in us. But look, let me take it a stage further. Let me take it a stage further and say this. The certain conditions for wilaya to become perfect, otherwise Allah will chuck you out from the basis of wilaya. You know what one of them is? Let me tell you this. Somebody comes to Ayatollah Bahchid once. They say, oh, give us a, a dhikr. We, we're in problems. What's the best dhikr to do? He looks up, he says, dhikr amali. Go and do amal. Go and do good. Help people. More than just sitting in a cave reciting Allah. Allah is to go and help people. Why? Bala is removed when you help people. Many a time you think your solution lies in reciting a dhikr. No, actually it lies when you go and help somebody. When you feed somebody, when you educate somebody, right? So now let me develop this. A person comes to the seventh Imam alayhi salam and they say to him, they say, look, Mola, I've come from Ray. Ray's in Iran, right? All of Tehran today would be covered by Ray. So he says, Mola, there's so much taxation in Ray, I can't afford it. But I know that the Hakim of Ray is your Shia. Can you help me? Mullah says, don't worry. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim writes a letter. In that he says, know that a person has our salvation, our shafa'a, if they do three things. Either they help their brother, or they make their brother happy, or they remove a difficulty from their brother. Wassalam. He says, go to the Hakim and give this to him. This man gets on his horse, goes back to Shahar Ray, goes back to the city of Ray. When he comes into the city, he goes to the house of the Hakim, knocks on the door. He says, I bought a letter from Imam Musab Najafar. 
Hakim was by Marifa, with Marifa. He comes running barefoot. And as he comes running barefoot, opens the door, kisses the man, kisses the letter, puts it on his eyes, opens the letter, kisses the man again, reads the letter. After that, understands. He says, oh person, what is your need? Tell me. He says, look, taxation is too much. He says, let me half your taxation then. Half said, says, go home. I'll pay for it. Pays for it. Next year, the same man goes to Hajj, comes to Imam Musa ibn Jafar. He says, your Hakim, your Shia there, paid for all of my taxation. I'm very happy. Imam looks up and he says, I'm even more happier. And do you think I'm just the one who's happy? My Jad Amir al muminin is happy. My grandfather Rasulullah is happy. Allah is happy. Know that when you help any of my Shia, we do dua for you. Right? We do dua for you. But look, if I just leave it like this, you'll think it's an amazing story. Let me take it a step further. A person comes to your sixth imam. Now listen to this. Comes to your sixth imam. Says, Mola, what haq does my brother have over me? Mola replies, he says, your brother has seven rights over you. If you don't fulfill all of these seven, Allah will chuck you out of our wilaya. So he looks up, he says, Mola, can you tell me? He says, better you remain ignorant because if I tell you the seven, I'm scared that you won't be able to do it. He insists, Mola gives him all seven. Now look, I'm not here to give all seven because I can guarantee you vast majority of you won't be able to do it. If you want, search it yourself. But I'll give you one. And if this one you can do, inshallah, slowly all of the others will open up. What is that one? This one, famously known as the golden rule. What you want for yourself, want for your brother. You know what that means? If you don't like people gossiping about you, don't gossip about somebody else. Be vigilant and careful. Perhaps the reason why we're all at home today is because when we come to the masjid, afterwards when we sit together, ilm rajal happens and you gossip to such an extent that you lose everything. You've come into the masjid to gain something. And what happened? Your fishara qabr increases when you die. See, this is what tawfiq is. Tawfiq is there. Don't lose that tawfiq. What you want for your brother. Don't cheat somebody if you don't want to be cheated. Don't look at somebody's spouse if you don't want anybody to look at your spouse. What does it mean? Do for other people that you want for yourself. That's one condition of wilaya. And if you don't have that condition, you're out of the wilaya. Look, you want people to give you a chance? Give other people a chance. You want people to forgive you? Learn to forgive people. That's one of seven. Imagine if we were to mention all seven. Inshallah, maybe in the next coming nights we will. Digest this for tonight. Go home and change yourself. Come back slowly so we can change. It gives us all a chance, including myself. It gives us all a chance in this Muharram to change. And if you can even do this one thing, then I guarantee you that the whore is close. As Ayatollah Bahjad said, Bada takes place. Look, our time is running. I want to mention to you a final thing. Even if you've sinned, don't ever lose hope in Hussein. Don't ever lose hope in the Ahlul Bayt. Let me give you a story of Ayatollah Hassan Zada Amali. Allah give him a long life. He's sick at the moment. Sahib Karamat. And I say this because I've seen it myself. With my own two eyes, I've seen that he is Sahib Karamat. Very easily he can read your dhamir. Everything about you from the beginning to the end of your life. He can tell you everything. From my own experience. Sahib Karamat. Ayatollah Hassan Zada Amali always wanted one thing. He wanted to be one of the students of Sayyid Ali Qadhi. Though Ali Qadhi is dead, but remember one thing, a spiritual master is such, even after he dies, he's still connected to his students. So Ayatollah Hassan Zada Amali had a student, had a teacher. That teacher's name was Ayatollah Hassan Ilahi. You've heard of Allama Taba Tabai. Allama Taba Tabai's brother is known as Sayyid Muhammad Hassan Ilahi Taba Tabai. If he's not more than Allama Taba Tabai, he's nothing less than him. 
The only reason you hear very little about him is because he was somebody who hid himself in Tabriz. One day Ayatollah Hassan Zada Amali says, he says, I came home. In the morning he would go, he would teach, he would study. And then at Dhuhr time he would come to sleep for about half an hour. When he came home at that stage, two of his children were fighting or playing, as children do. For whatever reason, that day he was, or he had a stressful day, he was stressed out. He says one thing to his children that broke their heart. Ayatollah Hassan Zada Amli says, and this is one thing of his, and imagine what we say on a daily basis. He tries to get to sleep, he can't get to sleep. Half an hour goes, he gets up, he says, look, I can't get to sleep. He realizes he said something that broke these children's heart. No fault of theirs, they're children after all. So he wants to go out, he goes, he buys sweets, brings it back, his heart doesn't help him. He knows that he's done something he didn't like. He says to his wife, look, three, four days, I want to leave Amul, I want to go somewhere. You know where he goes? He goes to Tabriz. Why? Because his teacher, Hassan Elahi, is there. When he comes to the door of Ayatollah Hassan Elahi, he says, I knocked on the door, Ayatollah Hassan Elahi came out. He says, what are you doing here? You should be in Amul, you should be back home. Why are you here for? He looks up and he sees Ayatollah Hassan Zada Amli's faces. You could tell by the face he's stressed out. Before Ayatollah Hassan Zada could say anything, Hassan Allahi says straight away to him, last night Gadi came to me. Gadi was dead, by the way, at this stage, 30 years ago. He said, Gadi came to me last night and said, you have done something that he's repulsed by. Said Hassan, Sheikh Hassan says, Hassan Zada Amli says, he says that my face went peach red. He begins to cry. He says, yes. I said something to my children. He says, repent change even that small thing that you say to your family that breaks a heart you're removed from the wilaya because they're she of ahl bayt be careful your wife your husband sometimes we take it for granted we say things to our children we say things to our parents we say things to our spouses be careful you say things to a shia the minute you're Lahan becomes such that it's offensive and you break somebody's heart. Be very careful because at that moment you're out of the wilaya. And then you think to yourself, why don't I have marif of Ahlul Bayt? It's not easy to have marif of Ahlul Bayt. Hadith says in and of itself, Akhbar of Ali Muhammad is such, truly such. One day somebody comes to Imam Hussein, says, Mawla, tell us your haqqaiq. He says, you won't be able to take it. He says, please tell me. Imam begins to open his mouth to speak. The person's beard went white, his hair went white. Imam stopped. That person f forgot everything. Imam said, may the mercy of Allah be on you that you forgot everything. You wouldn't be able to take it. Why? Require something more. Heart needs to be pure. For your heart to be pure, remember. So you can ask me the question, what has Wilaya got to do with the bro your brothers? No. The entire Shia nation is like a body. Be very vigilant to your fellow Shia brother. Look, I don't want to go on too much about this. Inshallah, tomorrow we'll continue the discussion further. If only we can take one thing home today. That's just that. Become true Shias of Ahlul Bayt. Why? Remember one thing. Ahlul Bayt's heart is very soft to you. Very soft to you. Shall I give you a story? Sometimes I think to myself, how giving a Ahlul Bayt to their enemies, let alone their friends. Look, I've given the story before, but I want to give it again. Every time that I repeat this, it hurts, affects my heart, hurts my heart. One year after Karbala takes place, Yazid sends an army of a hundred thousand. He says, go and pillage Mecca and Medina. In seven days in Medina, 1,000 illegitimate children are born. Rasulullah's mosque is demolished. But he says something. He says, look, whatever you do, don't touch the house of Zain al-Abideen. At this moment, they say Marwan, who is the Hakim, becomes very worried. He says to his servant, he says, look, I've got women, I've got children, I've got elders. 
these Yazidis are not going to tell between an Umawi and a non-Umawi. When 100,000 of them come, they're going to pillage everything. What should we do? So at that moment, his servant says, why don't you go to Ali ibn al Hussein?" He says, but I killed his father. He says, you don't know who Ahlul Bayt are. Go to them. Go to them and see what he says. They say, Marwan comes to the door of Imam Zain al He knocks on the door. Your gharib Imam gets up. If a person in his heart knows what sham symbolizes, how difficult it is for that person to come face to face with his father's killer. They say, Imam Zain al comes to the door, opens the door, his head is down. He said, what do you want? He says, do you recognize me? He says, of course I recognize you. What do you want? He says, Yazid is sending an army. Zain al I also have a Zainab at home. I also have a Sakina at home. But you know what? This is now in my words. I also have an Ali Yaskhar at home. I also have a Qasim at home. I also have Aun and Muhammad at home. I also have Habib ibn Mudahir at home. I have elderly people. I have children. I have a wife. I have aunts. I have everything. Zain al what should I do? You know what Imam says? He says, give them to me. I'll protect them. They say for one moment, tears come into this Mal'oom's eyes. He says, can I ask you a question? He says, what's that question? He says, when we were in power, we oppressed you. Now that you're in power, you're showing us so much mercy. You know what Imam Zain al Abidin replied? Tears in his eyes came and he just said one thing. He said, Marwan knows something. The difference between you and us is this. Your mother is Hind, our mother is Zahra. If they're so merciful to their enemies, Shias of Hussein, for one second, think where you're sitting. You're sitting in the majlis of Imam Hussein. You're sitting in the majlis of Imam Hussein. This is the time of istijabat of dua. You think if you raise your hands, Allah's not going to accept it? Let me tell you one more thing. Let me tell you one more thing. Look, we can't get to Karbala. For one moment, just close your eyes. Close your eyes and think that you're sitting in Medina. The first of Muharram is gone. Hussein's caravan is moving. Tomorrow they'll get to Karbala. Where does it start? 18th of Rajab. Go back and see. Where is Hussein? In Medina. For one second, go to that broken grave. When you go to that broken grave where there's no one there. She has. On your mother's graves, there's a candle. On your grandmother's grave, there's a candle. On your grandfather's grave, there's something there, right? On your father's grave, there's something there. Shall I tell you something? There's only one mother in the world who has nothing on her grave. Perhaps a voice comes from that grave to say, can somebody come and light a candle on my grave? Now, if you're sitting on that broken grave, imagine, if you were to sit there, what would you do? The first thing you would do is give condolences to Imam Hussein, right? After that, what would go in your mind? Ghurba of Zahra, Ghurba of Amir al muminin One part of the Ghurba of Zahra, loneliness of Zahra is what? They say that day, when Sayyid al-Shuhada decided to leave Medina, you know what he did? The first thing he did was, he went to the grave of his grandfather. On the way there, Umar Salama was there. Who is Umar Salama? His grandmother. Umar Salama raised Imam Hussein after Zahra. What does Umar Salama say? She says, son, where are you going? He replies, he says, grandmother, I'm going to my judge's grave. He says, why are you going there, my son? He says, because I want to complain to him. His Ummah is not letting me stay in Medina anymore. He says, Hussein, where are you going? says, I'm going to Karbala. 
I'm going to Iraq. He says, your grandfather said to me, Ahle Iraq will kill you. Imam Hussein goes, as he walked towards the grave of Rasulullah, he walks like a man would walk. Waqar as they walks. Walks there next to the grave. He says that when he puts his head on the grave, he remembers something. He remembers as a child when Rasulullah would grab him, put him next to his chest tightly. He remembers all of that. He closes his eyes wishing Rasulullah would come again. You know what he sees? In a dream he sees Rasulullah stands up from his grave, comes to Sayyid the shahada hugs him and he says, he says, Hussein, Allah has decreed that you are killed in Karbala. Mashiach of Allah such. So you know what Imam Hussein says? The first thing he says is this. He says, Grandfather, I don't care about myself. Just tell me one thing. What's going to happen to Zainab? <laughs> says, Allah has decreed that she's imprisoned. They say Imam Hussein gets up. Tears are in his eyes. As he walks out of the rose of the Prophet, a man comes to him and says, Hussein, why is there tears in your eyes? He says, my grandfather has told me I'm going to be killed in Karbala. He says, but Hussein, shahadat is for you. He says, that's not why I'm crying. He says, why? He says, my Zainab is going to be in prison. That's why I'm crying. Ali Zaghira is going to be imprisoned. My father couldn't hear my sister crying. He would say to the people of Kufa, go from here because Zainab is crying. You know the biggest sign is, the biggest sign that the women of the Ahlul Bayt were oppressed is a three-year-old girl. Why? Because that three-year-old girl's ears were still bleeding when Imam Zain al Abidin was burying her. Look, I wish I could say more. Imam Hussein then goes quickly towards the grave of his brother. He goes there, he gives final farewells. Hadith says though, when he goes to the third and last grave, who does he go to? His mother's grave. He runs like a child runs. He jumps onto the grave, tries to hug the grave. He says, mother, take me into the grave. <laughs> Nighttime falls, Imam Hussein goes back to his home. When he goes back to his home, say the Zainab calls him. Goes to say the Zainab. Say the Zainab says, Brother, all night my heart's been breaking. He says, Why? He says, Every time I go into my house, when I go into my room to lie down, I can hear a voice coming from outside. It seems like that there's a broken hearted woman saying, Wow, Hussaina. Sayyid so al-Shuhada looks up, says Zainab, recognize that voice. That's our mother Zahra. Next day comes. Next day, Marwan gives the hukum. Yazid's given a letter. I want bayah from Hussein. Gives the hukum. Zainab comes to know. Says, brother, where are you going by yourself? Says, I'm going to the court of Marwan. Zainab begins to panic. She runs to Abbas. She says, Abbas, Hussein is going by himself. Abbas, go and protect him. Abbas gets up, takes his sword out, goes running towards Sayyid al-Shahada. But Zainab doesn't stop her. She goes towards Akbar. She says, Ali Akbar, no son of Zahra is going alone to the court of... Ali Akbar takes his sword out, goes running, but she doesn't stop there. She says, Qasim, your uncle alone is going. Qasim gets up, says, Onan Muhammad, your uncle is going alone. They say 18 youth of Banu Hashim with their swords come to Imam Hussain. Says, Sayyid, says to Sayyidi, you're going alone while we're alive? Imam Hussain goes with 18 youth. As he gets to the court of Marwan, he just says to Abbas one thing. says, Abbas, if my voice is raised, you know what to do. <laughs> Abbas is outside. Imam Hussein goes inside. The door is locked. Mar Marwan says, Hussein, give your allegiance. Give your bayah to Yazid. 
At that moment, he says, you want me to give Bayat to Yazid? Somebody like me give somebody like him? As his voice begins to raise, Marwan says, go kill Hussein. Tradition says one man goes forward towards Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein's voice is raised. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas takes out his sword, grabs the door, the door is locked, takes his shoulder, hits the door, door falls, Abbas comes in, says, Mola, which one shall I kill first? Imam Hussein looks up. He says, Abbas, this is the city of my grandfather. I don't want any bloodshed in the city. You know what he says at that moment? He says, Abbas, now get ready. It's time for us to move from Medina. A Rawi by the name of Abdullah says, he says, I saw Hussein the day he left Medina, and then I saw Hussein on the day of Ashura. He says, what did you see? Rawi writes, he says, I saw Hussein sitting there. On his right was Abu al-Fadl Abbas. On his left was Ali Akbar. He says, Hussein gave a letter for all of those people who were going to Karbala. One man stood there and he recited. He called all of the women out one by one to come out to go on the camel. The first thing he says is this. He says, Layla, come out. Ali Akbar, go take your mother, put her on the camel. One camel would come, young son would go, grab his mother, put her on the camel. Next woman would come, next one would go, grab their mother, put them on the camel. Eventually a time came, a time came when Fidda came out and said, the daughter of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Umm Kulthum is coming. Abbas stands up, goes forward and says, I'm gonna make sure that my sister goes on top of the camel. When all of the women were on the camel, then Fidda with tears in her eyes comes out, says the daughter of Zahra Zainab is coming. Abdullah says, I saw Hussein stand up himself and he gets up and he goes to his sister. At that moment, his sister with tears in his eyes says, brother, please today, you're not going to put me on the camel. So at that moment, Imam Hussein says, Ali Akbar, you go. Zainab says, Ali Akbar, not you today. Onan Muhammad, you go. Says, Onan Muhammad, not you today. Imam Hussein says, Zainab, who would you like, Abbas? She says, no, I want that person who on the day of Ashura, the day after Ashura will put me on that camel. Say so the Shahada puts his head down. Sajjad, you come forward. You know what happens on the 11th of Muharram? I can't even narrate it. it. says, when all of the men are gone, all of the camels are ready, all of the women are standing there, the daughter of Zahara comes forward, puts one knee on the ground, says, women, stamp on my knee and go on the camel. All the women put their hands together, tears in their eyes. They say, how can we step on the knee of the daughter of Zahara? Says, stamp on my knee and go up. There's no other choice. One by one, all of the women with their tears in their eyes go on to the camel eventually a time comes when Zainab is all alone there <laughs> who comes forward a man in shackles comes forward grabs his arm but aunt by the arm puts her on top of the camel and at that moment the tradition says when Zainab is looking into the maqtal what is she seeing Look, my final words are these. This is the moment of dua. Abdullah says this, final thing he says is this. He says, I saw Hussein when Imam was leaving Medina, then I saw Hussein in Karbala. He says, what did you see Hussein in Karbala? How was he? Ayatollah Ni'mat al-Jazairi narrates. He turns around, he says, Fatima from Medina writes a letter to her father. Every day she would stand there on the door waiting for her father to come back. You know how daughters are like, right? After a daughter comes of age, 
It's not the wife who's waiting for her husband to come back. It's the daughter who's waiting. It's your daughter who calls you to say, Father, are you okay? This one daughter would stand there every single day waiting. When her father was leaving, she just said one thing, Father, please call me as well. Father says, maybe one day, maybe one day. A time comes, she writes a letter. She gives this letter to a Qasid. She says, Qasid, go to find my father. He's gone towards Kufa. They say, when Qasid comes to Karbala, when he comes to Karbala, he says to the people, who is Hussein? He sees that a broken father with blood on his face, his beard white, holding his back, sitting on the body of his son Ali Akbar was there, sitting on the body of his young son was there. Somebody said, that's Hussein. He said, Fatima didn't describe this type of a person. Says, how did he describe? She described him like this. He, she said, Abbas will be on one side. Ali Akbar B will be on the other side. Qasim will be in front. On and Muhammad will be around. At that moment, Imam Hussein says, I'm Hussein. Bring me the letter. He opens up the letter. What was on the letter? One sister was writing, brother, when the day comes, when you get married, don't forget this sister. Imam Hussein takes that letter, puts it on the chest of Ali Akbar. Son starts to shake. Brother is shaking. For the sake of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, may Allah accept our worship today. For all of those people sitting at home and for all of those people who are anywhere in the world who are watching this. For the sake of that moment, for the sake of that moment, when one small girl is sitting opposite Yazid and Yazid says, Oh girl, I've heard your father loved you a lot. If truly your father loves you, call him and see, will he come to you? They say two small hands come up. That small girl says, Father, Yazid is testing our love. Hadith says, Hussein's head began to rise towards the lap of this. For the sake of that moment, may Allah accept all of our hajat. May Allah hasten the Dhuhr of the Imam, Matim Hussain.